uh, yeah, happy to be here uh, and talk about our latest research uh, where IBM Research was working on in the last year. Uh, I'm Benedict, I'm working in the Zurich lab um, as a research uh, scientist, uh, and our work is mainly focused about a uh, geospatial foundation model, uh, and we hope to basically accelerate uh, geospatial analysis with these foundation models. But first, uh, let's ask the question, do we actually need like these domain-specific foundation models? And as you can see here, the, the images which you get from, from satellite uh, data does look quite different to other everyday images which you use for training, for example, vanilla uh, VIT. So, so the main motivation is really to train foundation models on these domain-specific data to get better accuracy on the downstream tasks. So for example, we have like uh, multispectral data with um, yeah, infrared data, or also in the top, uh, SAR data, so uh, that's uh, radar data basically from Sentinel-1, so I don't know if someone recognized uh, Lusan up there. Uh, so I guess like as, as a human, we are quite hard to understanding this, this data, and the same applies to like uh, general uh, computer vision models. And so our idea at IBM is to basically train, train this one foundation model uh, on geospatial data and then apply it to different downstream tasks. Uh, so the first model we released was Pritwi, uh, which is already openly accessible, and we use it for downstream tasks like uh, wildfire prediction or uh, floods, uh, or also other regression tasks like above ground biomass estimation, which is quite an important task when it comes to uh, estimating the, the uh, CO2 stored in, in trees. Uh, so let's uh, have a look at this uh, self-supervised dog, as you <laughs> uh, named the, the models. Uh, we basically trained a masked outer encoder, which is quite a standard model uh, often used in computer version, uh, but it's a little bit different for remote sensing because our data is different. Uh, so what, first we have like the multispectral data, so we not only encode the RGB bands, but multiple bands, uh, for example, infrared uh, images, and we also have uh, time series data. So we're not only encoding one single image, but like always three images at the same time uh, and feed all these data into the model. Uh, and the task is basically, uh, on the left side, you have the input image, which is basically mask, uh, and the task for the model is to reconstruct each images on the right side. So you have like a reconstruction task, which is quite similar to how LLMs are trained, for example, where you have to predict the next token. And then you just use the uh, MSE loss uh, to train the model. So it's a quite rather simple idea, which uh, works surprisingly well. Uh, and different for us is really that we have like this encoder, which has like the 3D patch embedding because of the uh, uh, time series we feed into this. Um, and the decoder, it's just like a simple multi-layer uh, step to reconstruct the images, uh, which is not really important. But like you can, after this pre-training, you can basically use this encoder and then do uh, fine tuning on your tasks uh, you're interested in. Um, one slide about the data we used for training. Uh, so this, uh, whole work is in collaboration with NASA, and NASA has one product uh, which is call, called uh, Harmonized Landsat Sentinel Dataset. Uh, so this is one of the biggest data sets, I would say, uh, which you can get freely available. Uh, it basically uses the data from the sent Landsat satellites uh, and Sentinel-2 uh, satellites and basically harmonize them. So you can basically train on two satellites at the same time. Um, and you have like a quite high revisit time, so each satellite constellation takes five days, so you have roughly like two to three days uh, of data every day for, from the Earth, from every place on Earth. Um, one downside is actually that uh, you only have like 30 meter resolution, uh, which is quite sparse. So Sentinel-2, for example, has 10 meters. Uh, but actually we observed that training on this 30 meter resolution, uh, you still get a model which performs quite well on, on 10 meter, for example. Uh, so the model is able to capture all this information even though you train on like a little bit different data. Uh, so that was quite interesting. Uh, and one tile from, from these uh, satellites has like a coverage of like uh, over 100 uh, kilometers. Uh, so that's quite big. Of course, you can't feed this into a model. It wouldn't fit into a GPU. Uh, so you basically need to have like a smart sampling uh, for the pre-training data. Uh, so for example, you don't want to have clouds in the data because they're like just random and the model is not really like learning anything from the clouds. So you need to get like cloud-free uh, areas. And you also want to have like a um, equal distribution among like different classes and climate zones and so on, uh, so that you not only have like I don't know deserts and forests in your data set, but also a lot of urban areas because 
this is typically like the area where you would apply the models to predict floods and so on. Um, so the first version of our sampling uh, was one terabyte of data from, from the US uh, only uh, from one year, uh, but we're currently working on expanding uh, this data set basically to uh, global coverage uh, to multiple, multiple years. Uh, and also, of course, this increases uh, the data you use for training. So next, let's have a look uh, at some uh, downstream tasks. Uh, one example I showed earlier was the flood prediction. And on the top right, you basically see uh, inference uh, from our model. Uh, and the red areas are the flooded areas. Um, and you see, OK, you don't see the uh, input image, but it's performing quite well. And also, if you look at some accuracy uh, statistics compared to other models, it's perform performing quite well. So uh, the first diagram, for example, is a comparison between the pre-trained model uh, and random weights. Uh, and you already see uh, this is the pre-trained model. And you see basically that you only need a couple uh, of steps to get a really good accuracy uh, with this pre-trained model compared to the second line, which is the random initialization. Uh, so you basically uh, have a much shorter fine tuning uh, and you already get pretty good results, which are also like better than the state of the art we found for this data set. Uh, one uh, current downside, I would say, for our model is really that you uh, have to train the, the encoder. So if you just use the, the frozen encoder and you just train a decoder hat, you actually don't really get a good uh, performance. So this is the last line. This is still something we're working on to basically um, get a better encoder, which you where you just have to fine tune the head and get the, set, the same results. That would be the goal, basically. Another uh, quite interesting analysis is about uh, the data amount you need for pre-training, uh, for fine tuning, sorry. Um, this is the second slide, uh, where we have a comparison between fine tuning on all the data and only fine tuning on uh, less than 13% of the data. So you basically just use, I think it's like 50, uh, training uh, images, and you basically get the same results, which is I find quite imp impressive. So that's like one other advantage of this foundation models, which are domain specific, that you really need only like a few annotated data uh, sources, uh, and you can get basically the same results. Uh, so that's like a huge benefit if you think uh, of like how expensive it is to, to label data. Uh, and another interesting uh, learning for, from this foundation model is really that it generalizes across the, uh, across the globe. So even though the, the encoder was only trained on, on the US data, you have basically the same accuracy all over the world, which is uh, quite nice to see. OK, but um, this is a fine-tuned uh, analysis. So you train the encoder. So the question is also like how good are the actual pre-trained embedding without any training? Uh, and one analysis we did uh, is to test the model on multispectral image retrieval, um, which is basically without any training. Uh, and the idea is here really that you have a database uh, on the uh, bottom left and a query image. And the task for, for the model is to uh, retrieve similar images, which have like the same semantic classes. And you can do that without any fine tuning by just feeding them through a two-spatial foundation model. Uh, and optionally, you can also do some compression to, to speed up the retrieval. Um, and then you can basically see, OK, how, how well does the uh, encoder actually encodes the semantic meanings uh, of the input images? And can you do stuff with it without any fine tuning? Uh, and the results are quite impressive. Um, so we compared a pretty to other uh, models uh, from the geospatial domain, like, for example, ZMEE. Uh, but also general computer vision models like vanilla VAT. Uh, and we do see that a, pr a pretty model outperforms all other models we actually tested. So we tested uh, the model on Big EarthNet, which is like more common semantic land use land cover classes um, uh, from Europe. Uh, and ForestNet uh, is uh, a data set from Indonesia, which, ha which has like deforestation reasons. So for example, oil palm plantation, mining, stuff like that. So this is like a really specific task. Uh, and like I myself, I, c I couldn't label these data. I have no idea about that. But uh, you can see that basically for this uh, common classes, the model performs like super well. And also on this really specific class, it still has like a quite decent uh, 
mean average precision. Um, and also, if you compare it to the other models, it performs quite well. Uh, one interesting uh, learning from this analysis is that if you just binarize the embeddings, uh, you basically save like uh, a lot of memory usage, but you basically get the same uh, accuracy. So that's uh, quite interesting to see that you can really do a lot of compression on these embeddings uh, from the Pritwee model and you still get a quite good uh, accuracy. So to conclude the learnings from this analysis, um, basically if you have common semantic classes, you get like a super good accuracy with just the pre-trained foundation models uh, if they're domain specific. Uh, and also compared to, to other models, Pritwee basically outperformed all the other models but by at least 4%. And if you look on uh, different compression methods, uh, you can basically get like two times speed of uh, for image retrieval, so this is task specific, but you basically don't lose uh, a lot of accuracy. So less than 1% of accuracy, but you get uh, two times speed of and uh, 32 times uh, memory uh, compression. Um, okay, so if you're interested in like uh, these examples or you also want to train your own uh, downstream tasks, you can basically just use Pritwee. It's openly available on, on uh, Hugging Face. Um, we also have, I think, the flood model and the burn scars model is also uh, freely available if you want to test it on your data. And the last thing uh, I want to show uh, is what we try to build to basi basically make these models also more accessible to everyone who is maybe not a coder. Uh, so one thing is really to build the models, but of course you also want to put them out there and to enable everyone to use your models. Um, so IBM released this Watson X AI platform last year, or yeah, I think it was last year, and we're basically working in our team on also providing one studio for geospatial data. Um, and here's like a preview of, of this uh, platform, which you can see where you basically can run just inferences with pre-trained and fine-tuned models, but you can also just fine-tune your, uh, your data set or the model with your data set uh, within the studio without any code also run your API, so that's the idea basically. Um, and let's have a look at the, the inference lab. So you basically have, for example, on the top left, you can just query one area you're interested in. Uh, you just type it in, uh, select the model, uh, and then you can run the, the inference, uh, but it takes some time, so I just uh, used one of the pre-computed uh, inferences. So here it's a flat uh, prediction in, in the US uh, and you're basically going to see the, the flooded areas and also the uh, input image in a moment. So there you can see some areas which are clearly flooded and the models quite well in detecting uh, these areas. Uh, one other example is above ground biomass estimation uh, where quite a lot of people are interested in. So this is another example uh, where you basically see uh, the prediction and also the input. And you can also do like Further analysis, like how much biomass you have, like in this certain area, uh, but this is all uh, some features which are not uh, implemented yet, but they're coming in the in the next month. Um, so that's that's the idea of like bringing out the models to to the users, which might not be coders uh, and don't want to run the whole analysis themselves. Uh, last slide. Uh, what are we currently working on? Uh, what are the next models you can expect from IBM when it comes to geospatial foundation models? Uh, the first one is, of course, that we continue working with NASA on like scaling up the Pritwee model and also the data. So that's like one main focus. Uh, but we also have like other projects together with ESA and other European partners. Uh, one is about compressed uh, embeddings, which I find quite interesting. So the idea there is basically to uh, run the encoders uh, where the data is because data transfer is expensive and just send the compressed embeddings to, to, to the users and they just have to run their uh, decoder heads uh, and get quite good results uh, with minimal uh, data transfer. So that's the idea of this project. And in another project we're working on uh, multi-satellite foundation models. So the idea is there to just use the data which is currently available. So for example, you have cloudy images in Sentinel-2. Okay, then let's just use Sentinel-1 and let's see how, how good it performs. So that's the idea there that you can combine multiple um, satellites and you just use uh, the ones you're interested in or which are good for your uh, downstream tasks. 
Uh, and we're also looking into vision language models, so I'm uh, happy to, to meet you guys and uh, talk about that. Uh, so that's another part of this project with ESA. Uh, and that was all from my side. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if you're interested in our models, feel free to uh, check them out. There are quite a lot of resources online where you get more information about it. And otherwise, I'm happy to take your questions. <laughs>